uh, Councilmember Burns has joined. Um, and so I think with that, um, we have a quorum. So the uh, January 18th meeting of the Reimagining Public Safety Committee is called to order. Uh, we'll begin um, as always with uh, public comment. Is there any member of the public seeking to give comment this afternoon? Uh, so please indicate by raising, using the raise, oops, sorry. Still can't use Zoom. It's 2022 and I still can't use Zoom. Um, anyhow, please uh, ind indicate by using the raise your hand function in the Zoom if you want to give public comment. Um, seeing uh, none, um, we can move on to item, the next item on our agenda, which is approval of the December 7th meeting minutes. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve those minutes? Move the approval of the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Council member Reed moves approval of the December 7th, 2021 meeting minutes. Uh, Betty Bogg seconds. Is there a discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any opposed? Uh, seeing none, the motion passes and um, the minutes are approved. Uh, so this brings us to our, our agenda item for the day, uh, which is the report out from the working groups. Um, the Violence Prevention Working Group has done some uh, exciting things in uh, collaboration with uh, Audrey Thompson and her team. Um, and I, I thought that they were gonna be present to report out some of that work as well. I see, um, I see some members of that group are here already. Um, but I think there may be more who joined, so we'll, we'll reserve that for the for second. Um, and as I indicated, the, the main prompt for this meeting was that Council Member Burns reached out and said that the Rethinking the Organizational Structure Working Group had had some interesting discussions. They, um, uh, just to set the table, I don't think they're ready to request for a vote or anything, but they wanted just to surface some issues that they've been um, thinking through that they thought would be important to share with the rest of the group. And so with that, let me hand it over to Council Member Burns. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bish, and, and um, sorry I'm going to be off off camera. Um, but yeah, wanted to to touch base with the uh, with the committee. We um, started off, you know, somewhat lost trying to find um, a model out there, you know, that we could use as a starting point. Um, to to remind everyone, you know, our our task was to rethink the organizational structure. Um, and you know, fundamentally think about how to reimagine our public safety strategy as if there were nothing in place currently. And um, and so we were, you know, initially lost trying to find something to ground us. And Kadeen and Paige, who are both on the call today from ACLU, um, really find found us lost at sea and and and, and encouraged us to look into a city. Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, uh, that is, I guess, a free of spirit as uh, Evanston has, has come to be. And they're looking at similar approaches to uh, rethinking the fundamental structure of their public safety strategy. And the more we've learned, I think, about them, we're not, you know, obviously at a point where we're ready to make any, of, um, you know, official recommendations, but certainly the commitment to um, to public health and in investing in public health and people and communities and um, is, is something that Brooklyn Center is committed to doing. And I think we share that same commitment here at Evanston. So without um, carrying off for too, too, much, too, too much further, out, introduce uh, Kadeen and Paige. They're gonna walk us through the same, so the same presentation we received from them uh, in, our, in our working group meeting uh, they'll provide to the full committee today. So, okay, Dean or Paige, if you want to take it from there. Katie, and I think you're on mute still. 
Ah, oh, the Zoom, the new year, new Zoom. Anyway, sorry, Kadeen Bennett with the ACLU of Illinois. I'm really happy to be here. I'm a lawyer lobbyist with the ACLU, our Director of Advocacy and Intergovernmental Affairs. And it's been really great having the chance to work with the folks on the subcommittee and, and uh, Mayor Biss um, and to bring whatever knowledge and expertise that we have to help support the work that y'all are doing. Um, so my colleague Paige from our national office is going to give the presentation and then uh, I will jump in as needed and, and answer questions. So thanks again and thanks for the invite, Council Member Burns. Hi folks, um, I'm Paige Fernandez, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Policing Policy Advocate at ACLU National. So I work on the local and state level across the country um, on police practices. I'm so sorry, my cat is being ridiculous. He's dropping things off my desk. So if he interrupts me multiple times, I apologize in advance. I might have to get off camera to like deal with him. Yep, that's another thing off my desk. Um, but I'm really excited to be here. Just give me one second while I deal with this. One sec. And while Paige is dealing with her cat, who is also a big fan of reimagining uh, public safety. Um, so Paige has been really involved in Brooklyn Center and working with Mayor Mike um, on their attempts to reimagine public safety. Um, it's a, a bit different approach than um, I think folks are doing in Evanston where they've passed an ordinance and they're now in a place where they're forming working groups to really rethink some of the buckets of work. And um, it, feels like from the, from the conversations we've had, Evanston is in the other space where with the mayor coming in and the city council um, having conversations with city council folks, there's been a working group created and some substructures. So there's some overlap there and I'll stop talking because Paige is back. I am. Cat is in the bathroom. He's locked in the bathroom for the time being. He had to go. Um, Thank you for your patience. But back to what I was saying, I was talking a little bit about my work at ACLU National. So right now I'm really focused on local level work, working with jurisdictions across the country on implementing alternative public safety and health models. So how do we stop relying so heavily on law enforcement? How do we implement models that are supportive and focused on prevention instead of punishment? How do we keep our communities safe um, and healthy? without having to rely solely on police forces. Um, most recently, we did work in Brooklyn Center where we passed a resolution in May of 2021 to reimagine public safety um, and create an entirely new department of public safety. So I'm going to, um, I know a lot of folks on this call have already heard about Brooklyn Center, so I'll try to run through it fairly quickly, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can you all see that? Awesome. Okay, so diving right in. Um, talk a little bit about what happened in Brooklyn Center, why this happened in Brooklyn Center. Um, as folks I'm sure are familiar, Dante Wright was killed by a Brooklyn Center officer in April of last year. Um, she was just convicted of manslaughter in December. Um, community advocates and elected officials in Brooklyn Center knew they wanted to act immediately on this. How do we prevent this from happening again? Um, and within a month, the city had drafted and passed a comprehensive resolution that is aimed at addressing police roles, responsibilities, and power while providing the community with civilian-led supportive services. Um, within the resolution that was passed in May, uh, there are kind of core, five core aspects. So I'm just gonna run through those. The first and most important aspect is that there was the creation of an entirely new department of community safety and violence prevention. Um, this department will house all other public safety departments or teams. So it will oversee the two existing public safety departments, the fire department and the police department. And it will oversee two new public safety departments that I'll talk about in a bit, the traffic enforcement department and the community response department. Um, what I think is really critical about this department 
is that in the resolution, it has a specific public health oriented mandate approach and the director is required to have public health expertise, not just public safety, law enforcement expertise, but public health as well. So this can be as holistic and expansive a department as possible to serve all the community needs. So to talk a little bit about the traffic enforcement department, this department will be unarmed, it will be civilian led, it will be focused on harm prevention, um, and will be tasked with enforcing all non-moving traffic violations in the city. Um, just a point on the language around non-moving traffic violations, I think just to lift this up, and I know folks are already thinking about it <clears throat> in these different committees in Evanston, but you know, the language we had to use was very specific based on Minnesota state law. There are specific state statutes across the country that dictate what kind of incidents law enforcement has to respond to and moving traffic violations in Minnesota is one of them. So non-moving traffic violations include what Dante Wright was pulled over for, which was an expired registration um, and some other minor offenses. It does not include things like DUIs, but includes largely like equipment violations, often things that people are stopped for that then escalate into worse situations or result in car searches or searches of a person. Um, this department importantly is not gonna be focused on punishment though, right? The It isn't now they're gonna be unarmed civilians pulling you over and ticketing you. That's really not the idea. This department is more focused on support. You have a tail light out, here's where you can get it fixed. Are you unable to get it fixed? Do you have some monetary economic issues that the city can help you with, et cetera? You know, it's really focused on harm prevention of moving forward and keeping the road safe um, without having to punish people, um, which we know results in a lot of collateral consequences. The second newly created department is the Community Response Department. Again, it will be unarmed and civilian led. It will be composed of trained medical and mental health professionals, social workers, peer supporters, and other expert staff. And it will be in charge of responding to all incidents where a city resident is primarily experiencing a medical, mental health, disability related, or other behavioral or social need. So that includes responding to incidents of um, homelessness, responding to incidents of substance use, um, situations where we know police often escalate the situation um, and where supportive services are needed to help the people in that situation. You know, when you are unhoused, you do not need to be arrested. You need to find permanent and affordable housing for you to be. Um, if you are using substances, you do not need to be arrested and punished. You need to find support and help to work with you. Um, so that's what this department will really be focused on. The Let's see, the fourth big aspect of the resolution was the creation of this Community Safety and Violence Prevention Committee. You know, this committee came out of the fact that the city recognized it couldn't include all of the public health and safety changes that need to happen in Brooklyn Center for residents to thrive in one resolution. So as a result, the city has created this Community Safety and Violence Prevention Committee, which will be made up of Brooklyn Center residents, specifically those with direct experience being arrested, detained, incarcerated, et cetera, anybody with um, direct experience with the criminal legal system. Um, and they will really be in charge of providing recommendations to the city council on how to change or initiate programs to improve community safety outside of what's outlined in the resolution, um, including by reviewing the local criminal code, choosing what types of infractions and laws the city really doesn't need to be enforcing, what can be decriminalized, what can be repealed, et cetera. Um, importantly, they will also be able to provide comment on police union contracts before and during negotiations to uh, the city council mayor and city manager who sign off on the police union contracts contract. And I have a graphic coming up of how this all works. I know there are like a lot of departments and different entities. So just bear with me for one more slide and then I'll show you an outline. Um, and then finally, the final aspect of the resolution included immediate harm reduction policy changes. So in September, the city implemented a site and summons policy 
that requires officers to issue citations only and thus prohibiting custodial arrests for all non-felony offenses and warrants. Um, and right now the city is developing a use of force policy for the police department to implement immediately. So I just went over a lot of different things, a lot of newly created departments um, and institutions within the city of Brooklyn Center. So here is a quick outline of how it all fits together. Starting at the bottom, we have these two existing police departments, right? You'll see that these are oval shaped for like existing. Um, the police department, the fire department, and then you have the community response and the traffic enforcement department newly created in squares. All of these departments will be reporting to and under the oversight of the Department of Community Safety and Violence Prevention, which will be head up by the director of that department. So the police chief, the fire chief, the director of the community response department, and the traffic enforcement director will all be reporting to the director of the Department of Community Safety and Violence Prevention. That department will be overseen by a civilian oversight committee that was also created in the resolution. So this newly created public safety body can be held accountable by the residents in Brooklyn Center. The director of the Department of Community Safety will report directly to the city manager. The city manager in turn works with the city council and mayor and takes instructions from the mayor. Um, the city manager is accountable to the city council. Um, and we'll work together to oversee the department. And then finally, the committee that I just mentioned on two slides ago, will work hand in hand with the department. However, it's important to note that this committee is all volunteer led. Um, so they'll work hand in hand with the department on improving policies around public safety and public health throughout the years to come in Brooklyn Center. This is a permanent committee. I'm so close to being done. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, just diving in a little bit to where we are right now. In December, there was a $1.1 million budget passed in Brooklyn Center to fund the resolution, which was very exciting. Um, in the past six months, the city has secured technical assistance and have signed contracts with groups like LEAP, which is a law enforcement action partnership to help build out these programs. So for example, LEAP has um, provided the city and advocates with a draft budget of what the community response model could look like over six months. So we use that budget to advocate for the um, budget that was allocated to this resolution in December. The city has also hired two FUSE fellows to work full time on the implementation of this. So one's focused on data analysis and how these policies and new departments are impacting residents and one's focused on community engagement. Um, we also just hired a project manager to oversee the entire implementation process of implementing the resolution. Um, and we have kind of a complex implementation outline that I'll quickly go over. Um, you know, the implementation committees look kind of similar to the public safety committees that already exist in Evanston. Um, so just bear that in mind, but it is a little bit complicated. I don't think you need, these details aren't important though. Um, I think the most important thing is to note that the implementation committee will be managed and overseen by the project manager that was hired um, about a month ago. And so this committee will largely be composed of Brooklyn Center residents, but will also have other experts who help out with policy development. There's a subcommittee for each of the aspects, each of the core five aspects of the resolution. Um, and this explains a little bit about how they're working in alignment with the city and city officials. But basically this subcommittee over the next year or these committees over the next year to two years will be working with the project manager and the director who will be hired in the next six months to really build out the resolution to build out the community response department and the traffic enforcement department. And that's it. So I'm going to stop there. And yeah, I'm and happy to Paige, thank, thank you so much. And, and before we take questions, Mayor Biz, I just wanted to say again, this is um, we're don't think of this as we're ready to copy and paste what 
Brooklyn Center is doing and, and bring it to Evanston. What we're what we found in this is is a model that we can learn more about. Uh, we found a city that that we can uh, partner with and learn from, and um, and and you know a, a, a ton of support in um, you know ACLU through Paige and K Dean, uh, as well as some other partners that Brooklyn Center is working with Fuse Fellows uh, and others that can help us um, you know really determine what is best for us here in Evanston. So I just wanted to. Um, to preface the next part of this with that statement. Uh, that is all, Mayor Biss. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so are there questions either for Paige and Kadeen or for Council Member Burns and their working group? Or other comments from the working group uh, for that matter? Yeah, I'll just hop in and note that I think this is uh, I uh, I think this is a really interesting uh, model to for us to maybe not copy and paste, but to really follow. Um, I think uh, the working group that uh, you may or best that you chair uh, is you know already moving in a, a similar direction, particularly with the traffic stop, um, uh, uh, the the non moving violation uh, traffic stop. Uh, proposal that has been moved forward. Uh, so I think this is a, a solid uh, roadmap to follow. And so I'm really excited about continuing the work of the working group um, to, to bring forward a proposal that uh, works here in Evanston. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, the proposal and everything that the ACLU, uh, what they present and talk about. And the one component that they are working still to bill out and address is the one with community. And um, as I've stated to, uh, to Councilman Burns, I think we should be doing that now and trying to make it a whole thing and the different component from each of the segment of the reimagining public safety. We should be talking to the people in the community and getting their support and what they think of it, what they feel and if there is something that is missing that they feel should um, should be uh, addressed in everything. Let's not wait till the last minute to bring in the community. One thing the city has done is we have left out the community and the only thing it seems to be saying pay your property tax and we are happy. But that's not what it should be. We should be trying to build it where we are not having incident that we are coming to a place where we are together. You're not having all of these problems. We haven't had them in the past. But the things in, that are happening and going on here in Evanston, it's like we are leading that way. So, but we don't want to, and we can stop that by including the community more in it. And I'm sure the ladies from the ACLU have seen that in Brooklyn, and that's why they are working to have uh, get that person to be able to work with the community. And very good job, Paige. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Esther. Um, I'll just chime in and say that, yeah, I think the community engagement at the start is like incredibly important. I think I just want to shout out the like grassroots organizers in Brooklyn Center. This seems like 
very ACLU heavy, but I think it's like really important that I'm just like representing on a part of like a very broad coalition that includes grassroots partners, law enforcement groups, city officials, um, community members, especially <clears throat> Dante Wright and Kobe Dimmicks Heisler's family, um, families. Um, so I think that like that community engagement part is critical and something that we hosted, you know, there was kind of a short window for passage in Brooklyn Center, um, but we did host a few or a few, a couple dozen um, community sessions for people to come and speak and there will be standing community sessions with the city council every month moving forward. So that's exciting. And I, and I guess what I'd say to that is, you know, we have some really effective organizers on this call. I think about, you know, Sarah and Evanston Fight for Black Lives, excuse me, if there's some other members um, on the call as well, um, who we can acknowledge. But, uh, you know, we have Citizens Network Protection, Ms. Esther. And so I really would love to hear from those groups, because they're effective organizers, about what uh, events we can do to not only um, you know, to, to not only discuss uh, where we're at as a working group, but where all the working groups are at, and certainly however the city and the individual alderman can support, I'm sure we do that. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to hear from the organizers who have, um, who are working right now to organize around these types of issues, what ideas you have and how we can support you. Um, I'll speak for right now for CNP since I was drafted. What CNP, we look at the Brooklyn Center and what the reimagining project is and what it does. And we looked at, at it in terms of how is that working in part of what we have been proposing and that is the um, Citizen Police Oversight Board here in this community. And we are finding that it is a lot of the things that we have worked on, brought forth, are in there, and these things are just coming in, and they are part of it, and we see it as melting in and being a part of this, uh, of our proposal for the Citizens Oversight Board, which is a big com component of the citizens being involved and saying, this is what we have, this is what how we want to see our community and us to be engaged with all of the city government would include the police department and how we can feel safe, don't have to worry about things and feel comfortable. But if there, it will not really work if we can't keep them feeling that we are moving towards that direction. Because at any moment, that there is a halt or a things to say, no community, we don't want to, or this part of the community, uh, your, yours is the hot spot, or we did identify you with things that is of a negative nature, then you start moving backwards. And our goal is to keep moving forward. So as this reimagining is a step forward, let's start having that with the community so it can be a big step forward. Of the community is the key to the whole thing. Thank you, Ms. Esther. Um, um, I could chime in too. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Bogan. I'm uh, here on behalf of Evanston Fight for Black Lives. Um, 
we really are most, most successful appealing to the youth and the young people in the community whose voice are really important. Um, but I think what we've started to see um, and what I would suggest is like, just especially for our working group, I think if we can have a plan, something tangible that we can present to the community rather than asking them to continue to try and ask to get input into how it should be. If we, if we have something loose that we can present to people and then ask for feedback on and make changes rather than have a loose plan, I think am I making sense and make it clear that we, we really do want to hear what people have to say and we're open to adjusting and making adjustments, not just making decisions and getting a yes or no. Um, but I think if we could start getting like pieces of the puzzle together and then we could talk about strategies to engage people. But I think that's a big piece of it is having something tangible soon to give people. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Burns, did you want to follow up on any of that or do you have any further thoughts or questions? Yeah, no, I appreciate both comments. And um, I think what Sarah expressed is, is um, has been my approach on issues like this. I think it is sometimes really exhausting and overwhelming to answer the same questions over and over for, for a population that has been doing it for quite some time. And so if we can do the heavy lifting of, of creating a draft or something to present to them, as Sarah suggested, um, with the understanding that it is, everything is open, you know, to, to change and, um, and amendments and changes and, and all that could be made at a moment's notice, then the community would appreciate that approach. But but certainly happy to, you know, again, and I also just want to acknowledge that while it's important that we engage the community around the, our, the work of our working group, I really want to think about how do we engage the community around all of the work that's happening here? And, um, and, and when do we start that community outreach and how? And, and who do we need to partner with? And I, and I called attention to the CMP and, and having some fight for Black Lives because even during the campaign, they, they both organizations did a great job of holding forums and, and educating the community through social media and other, other mediums. And um, I've always said, how do we not only put forth that effort during campaigns, but how, how do we continue that um, during uh, periods of legislation and governing and and reform and, 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 and structural change. Um, and so I, I just, whatever we need to do as a city, whatever I could do as a council member to support the continued engagement of our community, I wanna do that. And um, I'm not sure when that should happen, Mayor Biss, I guess I want to, would love to know your thoughts on it. You know, just when and when do we start that work and how? Um, I mean, I'll say, I think we should always do that work. I think, I mean, it's something that I spent some time pushing for last summer and, you know, we had a few, uh, a few early steps that, that we took, but I think we should, we should always be doing that. Um, and um, I take your point uh, and Sarah's point that, you know, perhaps with something like this is better to have a concrete proposal to put in front of people. Um, but I would say, you know, I think there is, uh, there's real benefit in not just sort of waiting and assuming that the, the perfect moment will happen in three months. I think I think you really need to um, to reach out to people uh, constantly and and um, and to establish a pattern where they're used to their input actually mattering and affecting what's what's being done here. Um, Patrick, your hand is up. It is so. Mayor Biss, I've, I've mentioned this in the past and I'm mentioning it here again, if, if helpful. Um, the Moran Center received a, a grant from Northwestern University um, to explore with system players, but also with community, the concept of a restorative justice community court. As, as you know, Mayor Biss, Chief Judge Evans has launched three restorative justice community courts throughout Cook County. Um, none of which are here in Evanston. And at the outset of exploring this, um, a really wise community member said, well, how about if the community doesn't want a restorative justice community court? 
Um, and so it, it, it caused the Moran Center to pause and instead uh, reach out to communities. So we've hired um, former clients of the Moran Center to actually be part of this process with us and to go out into community and engage community in some questions that maybe we presume we know the answers to, but maybe it's our arrogance um, that, we, that we make those presumptions. Um, asking questions about what is community? What does safety mean to you? Um, how, when do you feel safe? Um, what makes you feel safe? Um, all leading to uh, maybe systems questions about, about courts and police and policing, and, but also maybe about alternative models of accountability. Uh, what would it look like if the neighborhood held you accountable as opposed to systems uh, for some harm that you perpetrated uh, in our community? So although I'm not the city, um, I am I'm happy as we progress uh, in, in our outreach to report back to, um, to this committee with, with actually um, the young people who are doing the surveying, maybe most importantly, reporting out uh, what they are hearing. Um, so as we uh, can at least get a sense as to um, what, as, as Ms. Bogan referenced, what, what young people uh, in particular are, are stressing as of import. So just offer that up. Doesn't address everything, but offers that. No, but it's a component. I do want to so thank you for the, on a different Moran Center related note, to thank you for the, uh, the, the circles that I was invited to participate in as a, you know, kind of a sort of initial uh, community discussion project. I, I think, again, we, we just, we need to institutionalize, we need to be in the habit of, of, of reaching out for, for feedback uh, and, and um, I think that'll that'll result in both better feedback and and a better feeling of um, feeling of openness of government. Frankly, um, other thoughts or feedback or reactions to anything that we've heard so far today. Um, all right, um, in that case, thank you, Council Member Burns, for um, bringing these speakers. Thank you to Kadeen and Paige for uh, this conversation, and thanks to the working group for all the time you're putting into this, and we'll, you know, we will continue to kind of wait to hear from the working group in terms of the direction that they want to propose, but um, look forward to the continued discussion. Um, before we break, I, I just wanted to, um, give an opportunity for an update from the violence prevention working group. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, council uh, approved uh, an appropriation of north of a half a million dollars for a variety of uh, violence prevention efforts uh, that were um, brought forward by uh, Audrey Thompson and her team in collaboration with other aspects of city government. Um, and that the uh, version of the proposal that was passed uh, on January 10th reflected some very productive conversations between the Violence Prevention Working Group and, uh, and city staff and a kind of a, a incorporation of some of the working group's ideas that this, this committee has already uh, voted in support of. Um, and so I just wanted, I see that both Audrey and Andy Papacristos are on the call and just wanted to give them a chance to um, just kind of update folks on the outcome of those discussions and what, what next steps are looking like. And one thing that I'm not certain either Audrey or An Andy know about, so I'll share is that uh, one of the aspects of this was um, an offer on the part of um, Andy's group at Northwestern, um, perhaps supported uh, by uh, academics elsewhere uh, to do uh, data analysis. Um, and as of today, uh, the Evanston uh, Police Department uh, and Andy's uh, group at Northwestern have entered into a memorandum of understanding uh, to enable uh, data sharing. And so that we're, we're off to the races uh, with that component of it. So I want to thank city staff for working uh, much more quickly than is customary, customarily even possible. And that means not only our law department, but also, also the police department. Um, and uh, thanks so much to Andy for, for making your, your team available to, to help us with that. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, we'll, we'll be learning a lot, I think, uh, pretty quickly. And then I'll turn it over to Andy. And I see, and again, Audrey's here as well for, um, uh, to give um, additional updates.
Andy, did you want to go? Oh, go ahead. You can go first. It was who was going to unmute first, but I, I defer to you since. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, uh, thanks so much. Um, as Mayor Biss stated, uh, we did have um, a part of our proposal accepted and approved by the city council on January 10th. So of course now the, the, the real work begins in, in doing our best to implement what's already in the proposal, but also um, what we hope will be um, the start of a uh, workforce development program with violence prevention specifically in mind. So um, after um, an in-person meeting with our Mayor Biss and uh, Dr. Andy, as well as our outreach supervisor, Jeremy McCray, um, we thought that we needed some time to kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out what individuals needed to be involved in a discussion um, in order to create this um, Evanston-owned um, part of workforce development. And so uh, we are working now to create that task force. Uh, we do have several members already um, outlined, some um, you know, really recommended by uh, Mayor Biss, and we will look to get additional recommendations uh, from Dr. Andy. Um, I know that uh, because we're gonna be creating um, a policy that helps with the workforce development, we'll need someone from HR and Megan Falara has already um, agreed to serve as that person in the interim of us having an, an actual HR manager. And so um, uh, Patrick Keenan Devlin has also agreed to be a part of the task force. Um, and then um, there's some communication uh, that I need to have with Rachel Ruttenberg. Uh, Mayor Biss has already um, spoken with her about being a part of this group, and she is a part of Heartland Alliance. Um, so just making sure that we have individuals that are already doing this work to weigh in. Um, in addition to that, CTA has a second chance um, program, and Geisha Esther um, has also agreed to be a part. So we have a few more that we need to confirm, and then we'll be ready to hopefully meet in the next uh, week to two weeks to start really crafting our Evanston uh, program. So really wanna thank the Violence Prevention Working Group for, you know, I, I'm always that person that's happy to have my coattail pulled to say, hey, we got one more step before you finish that. And so um, thank you to this committee for all the hard work that you all have done. Um, and also to, um, Dr. Papa Cristo, Dr. Andy, and um, the Violence Prevention Working Group uh, for really helping us to get a program that we know will be beneficial to our residents. Thank you. I, I won't spend too much time. I, I appreciate all the help in the working group, Nathan, Evangeline, uh, Councilman Reed, Fleming, uh, Sean is part of the group, Sarah is part of the group. You know, so really the, the sort of comment at the December 20th holy cow, that was almost a month ago, what happened in the last month, uh, meeting about the both and, you know, we were, this working group is really concerned with thinking about figuring out how the sort of tends to be older group of individuals, you know, what sorts of special um, concerns and programming they need, which I think I'd mentioned in the last meeting, won't be the same as the young folks, their different needs, they might have their own kids, for example, the conflicts, how do we track those things? And, and so looking at, I also just want to stress to this group, you know, as we look at the data that we're going to look at from EPD, the other step will be sitting down with other uh, individuals involved, lived experience, outreach to put in the, 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 um, the qualitative information around it to understand some of the dynamics. You know, Evanston, as we all know, is a town where these are, are some of these are old disputes. They're embedded in neighborhoods and families and spill over to the school and really being conscientious about how we approach those, especially from a non-enforcement perspective. And there are national models, but we want it to fit Evanston. Uh, and so I, I, I'm really excited about the opportunity uh, and, and really look forward to working with the city and Audrey and her team uh, and the rest of the working group. So I'm happy to, to chat and answer questions about it, but I'm not gonna keep talking. I've been talking all day. So thanks, thanks for the opportunity. I know our, our group is, is ready and excited. Thanks so much. Any questions or feedback for uh, Audrey and Andy?
All right. Well, I just want to again thank thank both of you. I think you know I think the collaboration here gives us an opportunity to really get this right and and as both of you said, build a model that is informed by national practices, but is built for Evanston by Evanstonians. And I think that's that's really where where the recipe for success is going to be centered. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, really appreciate everyone's um, making themselves available for this. Um, on uh, you know we're sort of no longer in the habit of meeting every two weeks, but really thought that um, given, given the updates, it was important to get together and I appreciate people taking the time. Um, and with that, um, seeing nothing further on our agenda, the January 18th meeting of the Reimagined Public Safety Committee stands adjourned and um, we'll be in touch. Thanks everybody. <laughs>